In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One afternoon last year, I came back to my office at school and saw a note on my door. It read, Jesus was here. At first I thought it was some kind of joke, and then I realized what it really said was, Jesus was here, the Camel Hall electrician who was going to help me with some electrical work at my apartment. <laughs> However, I still think about that note. What if Jesus were here among us, teaching, healing, and performing miracles, such as we see in today's Gospel reading? I don't think it would be a stretch to say that it would be mind-blowing, even supernatural. This is the kind of experience we're talking about with today's Gospel from Luke, called the Great Catch of Fish in Biblical Literature. In this narrative, Peter, James, and John were unlucky fishermen for the night. Jesus arrives and tells them to go into the deep water and drop their nets on the other side of the boat. They follow Jesus' directions and end up with such an abundant catch that neither their nets nor the boats could hold all the fish. Peter is then overcome with humility in the face of God's obvious presence and work. Jesus tells Peter not to be afraid, and then he calls Peter to another kind of work that is qualitatively a different kind of work and life. He tells him, soon you will be catching people which in other Gospels reads as, you will be fishers of men. Peter's call as a disciple is delivered in the midst of an experience of abundance and grace, a great extravagance, and an invitation to leave the status quo of the unknown of his own life for the unknown journey with Jesus. So after the catch of fish, followed by Jesus' admonition, do not be afraid, and his prophetic promise that from that time on they will be catching people, Luke tells us they brought their boats to shore, left everything, and followed him. And this is the image that stays in my mind. Two fishing boats abandoned on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and three men walking off into a completely uncharted territory. And I don't think this is just about three men and Jesus in biblical times. This could be our story as well. Not that we are abandoning the center of our professional lives and taking a turn into the unknown to follow Jesus, although there are certainly those of us who feel called to do that. I mentioned one of them in my e-blast uh, from this week. But hearing the call of Jesus, that call to follow, no matter how it comes to us, also calls for our response. John Greenleaf Whittier, American poet and Quaker, reflecting upon this calling of the disciples, writes in the famous hymn, in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea, the gracious calling of the Lord, let us like them without a word rise up and follow thee. That's sometimes an obvious response, sometimes the biblically and theologically desired response, but it's still something that takes a lot of courage. And while Jesus calls the disciples and tells them that they will be catching people in the future, he also calms them with the words, do not be afraid. One of my questions in reading this particular passage is, why shouldn't they be afraid? Why did these soon-to-be disciples trust Jesus so easily and completely? If we look at the passage again, we could say that the reason that they're not afraid is that they have experienced living proof of Jesus' profound ministry. They have been witnesses of great blessing. Unlike similar stories in Mark and in Matthew, Luke's version of this call gives Peter the opportunity to witness Jesus' powerful teaching, the healing of his mother-in-law, which occurs in the previous chapter in Luke, and then the, finally the miracle of the great catch of fish. These are extraordinary events 
that the disciples, soon to be disciples, cannot dismiss experiences of abundance and grace that transcend normal, everyday reality. So in this moment of call, Peter is overwhelmed with humility in the face of such power, much as Isaiah was in today's Old Testament reading. Witnessing the holy, holy, holy of the seraphs and God's questioning call, whom shall I send? Isaiah responds with what he has witnessed of God's power and glory, and he answers, send me. So as we listen to this passage, we as 21st century seekers and followers might begin to see that this call, however it comes from Jesus, necessitates a response. That's how calls work. Without a response, there is only empty, unfulfilled opportunity. An offer without an acceptance, a proposal without an I will. However, with a response to God's call, there is an explosion of possibility and the promise of a life that is qualitatively different from the one left on shore. Like Peter, we too see living proof of God and witness his glory. And through the mercies of God, we respond. Jesus says to Peter, from now on, you will be catching people. And with any luck, we too are caught. Some of us have been on the journey with Jesus since we were literally babes in arms and sealed in the waters of baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Other, others of us have left the church maybe in adolescence or college years and were called back for any number of reasons, intuiting a need for the solace and grace that we sensed would be here for us. Others of us have come here as adults because we had a hungry heart. On a personal note, I can identify my own movement from an uh, in-church since birth through adolescence baptized person to an out-of-church network young adult needing a witness of healing. In the midst of this period, one of my aunts died and I attended her funeral. My sister had already returned to the church and had become connected with a group of my aunt's parishioners. At her funeral, I watched my sister greet and be greeted by so many people, embracing and showing the authenticity of God's love and spirit. When I remember that funeral, I'm reminded of the verse, see how the people, how the brethren love one another. I witnessed real love that day, my, and my own heart and mind quickly moved onto a seeking path, sparked by a promise of the abundance of God's living presence. I had seen living proof that God is alive in the world, igniting a kind of love that seemed different, new, and profound. Living Proof is also a title of a favorite song of mine by Bruce Springsteen. And you noticed, you might have noticed I used Hungry Hearts earlier, which our bishop, uh, John Taylor, has um, kind of uh, borrowed from Springsteen, I think, for his Feeding Hungry Hearts, which is uh, his theme for this moment in our diocese. But the song Living Proof affirms the way in which the goodness and glory of God shines through the dross of life and becomes an epiphany, especially in the season of God's presence in the world. It becomes a way in which God calls us over and over again in the course of our lives to respond to his call, to leave our stuff on the beach and to follow him. Springsteen writes at the birth of his son, he says, well, now on a summer night, oh, in a dusky room, come a little piece of the Lord's undying light, crying like he swallowed the fiery moon. In his mother's arms, it was all the beauty I could take, like the missing words to some prayer that I could never make. Oh, in a world so hard and dirty, so fouled and confused, searching for a little bit of God's mercy, I found living proof. And later in the song, he says, it's been a long drought, baby, tonight this rain's pouring down on our roof. Oh, looking for a little bit of God's mercy, I found living proof. 
No matter where we are in the journey, I believe that God's call to us and our response continues to happen throughout our life. This is not necessarily a once-in-a-lifetime phenomena. God's Spirit blows through this world and leaves evidence of his presence, glory, and love. And when we experience moments of recognition, we are reconnected to God's call to follow him. Other times we're caught up in the life of the Spirit after a long drought, when we witness something that says, I am alive, follow me. And we are renewed in that call and that life all over again. Thanks be to God. Amen.